Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon, and we have another excellent guest who I'll introduce in a moment. But first, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for your support in supporting this podcast. We got to number 42 in the uh, charts the other day for audio downloads on Chartable. We were beating Spiked and Brendan O'Neill, people like that. We were right up against Russell Brand, like a female TV executive in 2006. And uh, obviously, that's just audio. He smashes it on video. But we're doing very well. And, you know, this is this is like my third thing after GB and Weekly Skeptic. So we are smashing it. Thanks very much. Even though we haven't quite fully worked out even the format of the show. So thanks for your support. And if you want to keep the podcast going, I don't do adverts or anything. So it's buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon. Leave a quick donation, a little message there, and I'll reply to you. Or I highly recommend going to nickdixon.net, which is my sub stack, where you get all my brilliant articles, which are very good. And also soon, hopefully, I'll be putting some extra podcast content on there as well. nickdixon.net, it's five quid a month or 50 quid for the year. Pretty reasonable to keep this podcast going and not have adverts and stuff. So that's a quick plug at the start. Now, let, me, let me introduce our guest. It's a returning guest, Mr. Alex McCarran, McCarran genius filmmaker and all-around legend. How are you doing, Alex? Hello. Thanks for having me. I got your name wrong there, but I, it's pretty poor. You'll probably have to edit that yourself because you're the, yeah. <laughs> you're the genius filmmaker. You just go through <laughs> fixing all Nick's mistakes. But um, there's so many things we could talk about. And you've got your new studio, by the way. Do you want to plug that? Uh, yeah, it's the, the Westminster Podcast Studio. At the moment, I haven't got the website up, I haven't got the Facebook up, I haven't got the Instagram up. Uh, basically, no advertising or digital presence in any way. Um, but I'm <laughs> going to have mouth. all of that. And at the moment, I've got you and Toby in and the bombshells. I've had a few more clients, a bit of interest, but I should get that up and running properly. It's going to become a kind of interesting viable business and partly it's aimed at the sort of sound end of the market although i will you know anybody can come but i've noticed that there's a problem with some studio suppliers you know media suppliers have denied service to anything vaguely sound so i mean, I think there's a market there to safe space is that a word that we can use but yeah hopefully it'll be a fun yeah. thing pretty soon i mean it is it is, it right, is a cool thing. Yeah, we've used and... it. it's it's already out there yes we've used it and it's gonna be getting better and better and hopefully we'll do a yeah. current thing there soon and it'll be awesome yeah and, um, and, gonna, right, and there's so many topics we well to all people who might complain that um it's still a learning by doing and i'm gonna have this this the main sets are going to sort of, they're going to evolve to look slightly nicer and uh you know get better stuff in any sh with you we've only shot against one wall there are two others with different patterns and different things and and anybody who comes in can sort of stamp their own brand on it as well uh so it's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of the moment a bit of a blank slate yeah, we just moved to the new studio with Weekly Skeptic, and immediately people are like, why is the sound not perfect? Why is the video not perfect? It's like, guys, with teething problems, we're trying, we're getting there, it's going to be great. Calm calm down, everyone. I think Bombshells but, has yes. come out pretty pretty well. I was, I was really pleased with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think... That's you know, our new show on the great. base yeah, platform. With, with yeah. Amy and Fleur, and the first one was with Matt Goodwin. Um, yeah, I was just really... I mean, this is totally nothing to do with content, which is what your listeners probably are in for, but I'm just thinking visually and audio. I think it sounded and looked great. So I'm, I'm really pleased. Okay. Check out Bombshells on our other platform on Based. That's my other platform, which has nothing to do with current thing. But um, that's also five quid a month. Yeah. Um, no, actually, people, last time you were on, Alex, people said you were very smart and interesting. The only, the only complaint was you spoke quite slowly. Could you... Step it up a bit, <laughs> one point five speed. It. I could, I could try. It's it's getting well. I suppose with late afternoon, I'm I'm coming to the end of my afternoon slump, which I already always have. And then with the two children as well, it's always very very tiring. Um, yeah, very early. Funny start. how people will criticise any everything. Not yeah. Could he speak a bit faster? <laughs> that's, my, <laughs> that's my voice. <laughs> I think someone said yeah. if he was any more stoned, he'd be lying down. So I kind of like. <laughs> You're just a chill guy, which is good to yeah. have around when there's people like neurotics like me around. I think it's quite useful to have someone a bit more chill. Um, and by the way, I'm on the Coke Zero. Back after Lent, I managed all of Lent without a single Coke Zero. Haters will say I drank some Diet Cokes as a loophole because I, I don't like Diet Cokes. So it was still quite a punishment. Although now I've got used to Diet Coke and now Coke Zero tastes weird. So I don't know. I'm all over the place. But I did I'm manage. On milk stout. Um, What's that? 
it's you know it's very much an old man drink um it's, mm. it's what's called a phantom brand or a ghost brand where they don't advertise it at all they just make it yep. um a bit like a podcast studio yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the this is what um one of the things that contributed to alex the hurricane higgins drinking drinking himself to death apparently he just lived on a diet of milk stout and right. um it's, it's, alcoholic. it's only two percent so it's quite I, I quite like it it's nice Nice. You've got your protein and your alcohol. Um, I'm guessing. Yeah. I've got no idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, this maybe is a we'll kick off with... health drink, actually. Yeah, life giving milk stout. Um, <laughs> the new sponsor, actually, by the way, I said we had no sponsors. Next week it will be milk stout. Welcome yeah. to the current thing brought to you by milk stout. Do you want to drink yourself to death while playing snooker? Milk stout. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Soon we'll crack on. I've threatened now three or four times to crack on with the topics, yeah. but we should crack on. Um, I thought we'd start with this thing about Rishi, and it's the, it's the wider, more interesting point we'll get into about Labour and my post about that, and if you agree with me. But let's start with the poll that said um, in the Sunday Times yesterday, as we record, Tories to hold under 100 seats to Labour's 468, says exclusive poll. This was an MRP, which for fans of this kind of thing, is a or not fans of it, is a multi-level regression and post-stratification poll. But it's a bit complicated, but instead of trying to find I was saying it to Lewis on headlines. I was like an 82-year-old Jewish man from New York who votes green. They just find like men, New York, Jewish, 82, green separately. It's easy to find the number of people then. Then they put them all together and find the probabilities. Then they do it for a single constituency. It's all a bit mathematical and beyond me, but basically it's more accurate. Dominic Cummings says they're very accurate. And this has Mm. the Tories on 98 seats getting absolutely spanked. And there were some other interesting details that Rishi gets hangry due to fasting and also that he can't make a decision. He kind of just triangulates with everyone. And uh, what do you think? What do you think? Oh, yeah, you've all got a point. And can't make a decision. It takes ages to make decisions. First, I don't agree with the hangry point because I'm a practitioner of fasting myself. Well, I haven't fasted for a couple of weeks. But, um, uh, you know, th- this is the point where the haters go, well, it's not working. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, well, because well, you're drinking would... so much milk style. It's like you, yeah. you're fasting from food. Yeah, no, so I fast to keep level because <laughs> of all the milk stuff. <laughs> no, I, I've come down about three three belt buckles since I started doing it. Um, oh, nice. And then, and then last sort of month or so, I've come down a little bit too. But um, anyway, it's, it's beside the point. The point is, is that um, when you fast, people don't like it. And so they, they attribute problems to fasting. So I, I used to be accused of being too tired uh, in the afternoons. And I'm like, I'm always tired in the afternoons. Like I fall asleep. While while conducting interviews before, um, so you know, uh, and it's so I'll, I'll set that aside. I think probably the, it's not the hangry. Probably he's just very touchy because this is a job which he's wanted to do for a long time. That he's engineered various cues in order to make sure that he does it, and he can't do it despite yes. being highly intelligent. And Tim Shipman did a spread on this in the Sunday Times yesterday. It was quite interesting where they're saying basically he triangulates everything because he doesn't want to upset everybody, anybody. Yeah. So, that's what I said. yeah, yeah. And so basically he will just muddle through and then come up with some compromise that, you know, nobody's happy with. Yes. And, and if you look at the sort of signature policies of his uh, reign, like what are they? Sort of uh, inhibiting vaping, banning smoking, <laughs> nothing really on tax, nothing on infrastructure, nothing on the health service, just a whole bag of nothing. And yet, these kind of fifth or se- fifth or sixth order issues, um, you know, that probably they the smoking thing has probably come up in some focus group of sort of you know middle aged women in Utoxita or something, and they've decided, yeah, let's do that. That will be our manifesto. Um, and the key thing is, he's uh, in fact, as Cummings predicted, by nailing your political colours to the mast of "I will stop the boats." without leaving the ECHR or more broadly doing any of the, the uh, infrastructural things that and I, I don't mean physical infrastructure, I mean political infrastructure to, to enable yourself to, to do any kind of radical policy, you, you will fail. And he has failed. Um, and I think one or two days ago, it was 5,000 arrivals had been reached, which is a record of some sort. And I put out a tweet about this on X post where I, I thought of Edgar de Peaceable, um, who was the king of England in the sort of the nine sixties, nine seventies. And he built this Navy, 
uh, well, the first in sort of me early medieval Europe, which was capable of patrolling the North Sea and the Channel to prevent raids from the Vikings and all the rest of it. And that's why he's known as the Peaceable, because it was a golden age, it was a very peaceful reign. And he did that, yeah, what, a thousand years ago, more than a thousand years ago, then 2024, it's impossible. It, it, it's absolutely impossible to stop people landing in small boats. And there, there's a trend I've noticed as well amongst regime, you know, blob people, where they'll say something that they don't like is impossible uh, as a means of throwing bureaucratic obstacles in front of any kind of politics that they don't like. And and this is this is another example of that. And, you know, in some ways it's a, it's a legacy of Blairism by effectively the Blair government wasn't exercised in binding the hands of his successors. Uh, and I think we're still seeing the results of that now. Although I, I think it's important not to blame the not to leave the current government blameless because if they had any kind of political noose then they would stop these things you know all it takes it, it's you know it's often forgotten that the the british constitution you know they still have a 60 something majority you need a simple act of parliament to avoid anything to get anything done mm. the keir starmer's pension was an act of parliament have you seen this no, you've never seen this. So, if you Google the Keir Starmer Act of Parliament, uh, the Keir Starmer Pension Act, so because when he was DPP, in order to like formalise his pension, for some arcane reason, it requires an Act of Parliament. So, in sort of twenty thirteen or whatever, his pension was an Act of Parliament. It, it was voted on. It went through. Sounds and, very Starmer. And, and you think, you know, especially you know, a year or two ago, three years, it was eighty seat majority you could have done a lot of stuff. You could have torn up anything. And yet now, and so this is why there were nothing. And actually, one question I would put to you is, I, mean, I know why I'm unhappy with the Tories, but, you know, why do you think the median voter, I mean, is the median voter interested in stuff that we are? Uh, hmm. Or are they just annoyed at um, inflation? Uh, is immigration a massive concern for them? I, I think it probably is. Yes. Okay, so many things. Funny you said political noose. I was thinking they've definitely got a political noose, but not so much <laughs> now, which is be the problem. Very good. And by the way, I want to quickly apologize to the um, viewer that I'm sort of bathed in light. I haven't got a, anything on my window yet. And it was Easter yesterday, so I'm sorry for looking like the risen Lord there. But the, um, yeah, well, Jenrick said that he just said on to GB News that, that Rishi isn't even interested in legal immigration. He couldn't get him to talk about it, legal, mm. not illegal immigration. And so that's very strange, given it's, often the top three, sometimes the top one issue facing the people in, in polls. And um, I, I just want to quickly touch on your Blair thing as well, um, whether it's a continuation from Blair or whether the Tories have been worse. Academic agent who we've had on the podcast put on X that the Tories are the most radical left government we've ever, we've ever had, the, the current Tories, you know, more so even than Blair, which is mm. interesting. As to why, it's an interesting question isn't it? because some normies, I mean, the kind of people in my football team, the Remainer Liberals, of course, they're just annoyed with the Tories for incompetence. They say Boris ruined this and that. They're just, you know, they think Starmer's going to come back in, put us back in the EU, solve everything. They're just fully on board with that. They're very, they just think anyone who talks about immigration is racist. Or if pressed on it, they'll say something like, well, you know, cultures change from time to time, blah, blah, blah. Like the whole extinction of, uh, of England doesn't, doesn't seem to matter to them, which is extraordinary. So they're, 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 that's what they think the Tories are just incompetent and racist. That's them. Yeah. But as for the Tory voters... What what is disillusioning them from all the replies I get and things? Yes, it's immigration, it's general wokeness, it's general ineptitude. Immigration seems to be the main one. It's also the economy. It's basically everything, isn't it? It's they haven't done anything conservative. As you say, they could have got rid of the equalities act. They could have got rid of it was that actually Cameron that brought it in? They could have got rid of so many things. The ECHR, the Supreme Court. They could have changed. They haven't done anything at all they've continued and accelerated the new labor project which is which is fascinating and so what is wrong i was thinking about this last night in a kind of more general way i was kind of half asleep thinking how strange that we live in a time now where there's a general feeling of total decline and like 
the end of our country and maybe the end of the West. And it's so strange that even just a few years ago, we didn't live like that in the early 2000s, even in the 2010. We didn't, really, we didn't think like that at all. We weren't thinking about it. So what mm. did change? You know, what did change? Why are we committing suicide, to use Douglas Murray's imagery, in the West? And I was thinking, is it that leftism is an inherently self-loathing ideology, that, you know, post-colonialism, decolonization, and that's just taken hold? Or is it deeper than that? And it comes down to we're not even reproducing, which our friend Ed Dutton would say is to do with wealth being an uh, evolutionary mismatch and that we're not, we just not, we don't reproduce when we're not confronted with death. So whatever reason, Western countries and countries like Japan and South Korea are not reproducing. So it's kind of multifaceted, isn't it? You've got, we're not reproducing, which is a kind of inherently sort of self-loathing, self-annihilating position, obviously. Mm. Then we're, we're destroying ourselves through massive numbers of immigration. So the countries are unrecognizable and kind of miserable just to walk around. Sorry if that sounds bad. It just kind of is because it just, just, you know, because it's so alien. And then you've got the economy is bad and then you've got wokeness on top of it. And, and you've just got everything is bad. But, it, but why, well, why it is, is the, it's kind of a key question why it had to be that way. I think there's a couple of things there. Firstly, I mean, things are bad, but, you know, you do wonder if within this, you know, highly politicized bubble in which we operate, we can be guilty of what I would term inverse Gretaism. <laughs> where, you know, Gre- Greta and Rebellion and Justapol firmly believe that human civilization will end in the next one or two generations. Um, and, you know, maybe we're also guilty of indulging in similar catastrophism. Um, I think another factor is you know, I-, I wouldn't dismiss the kind of leftist self loathing ideology thing because to take your remainder friends. And to mix that with what academic agents said about this being the most left-wing government, I, I know exactly what he's talking about in terms of if you look at the basic facts of, in terms of the social policies that have been brought in, immigration running at you know orders of magn- an order of magnitude higher than it was in in the nineteen nineties, um, taxation being the highest since the war, um, and your Remainer friends they probably don't think in these terms I mean, to your friend. I mean, I know these people too, not the same people, <laughs> but, you know, I, I move in similar circles and to, for them is there's a kind of that I think they, their political view is governed by kind of axi- axiomatic anti-Toryism um, that Peter Hitchens has written about um, frequently. He, he wrote about it a lot in the abolition of Britain, how it all came in the nineties where people, the comedians just say Tories, uh, and but not nothing beyond that, uh, no kind of analysis. And so, you could have a situation where the people, the sort of normie centrist remainers, who effectively inhabit the blob, uh, are the the blob's minions or are, are part of the blob. It, I mean, the the blob could be like a sponge, for instance, where it's a kind of collective consciousness, were you know, constructed out of you know, m- multiple individuals into, into some kind of hive. Um, and AA was critical of the term, the blob, by the way. The other day he was critical of terms like Charlotte Gill was trying to get big woke trending. He was very critical of that and the use of the mm. term, the blob and anything like that. He thinks these are sort of unappealing terms that don't uh, don't, don't appeal to anyone. I, anyway, I really so. like the blob, but I'm talking to you and your audience, which isn't a general popular, like, yeah. similarly, I, I would... If I was running a political campaign, I'd probably try and ban the word woke from being uh, used. It's something like, I think Matt Goodwin said that 50% of voters know, I don't know what woke means, but 95% know what political correctness means. Yes. Um, Which and, is interesting because it started out as such a radical idea, political, radical, obscure leftist idea, and now it's so amazing. Yeah. But anyway, sorry, I broke up your but, flow there. Yeah, so, so effectively, it's, it's essentially, what's the, the worldview of the, the sort of centrists who run the civil service and the kind of NGOs and the, the blob organizations. Um, perhaps it's a little bit like, you know, when you put your thermostat next to the boiler or a radiator, you shouldn't do that because it thinks that the your temperature is a lot hotter than it actually is in your house. So you should put your thermostat in a kind of cold or like far away from any kind of heat source so it can more correctly gauge the ambient temperature. Well, because they live in this uh, axiomatic anti-Tory cultural mindset, 
um, because we have a hysterical media that's disconnected from reality, um, in spite of the Tory government bringing things that they completely wanted and support, more immigration, more tax, uh, you know, social things like gay marriage and all the rest of it, um, they don't really consider that those things just kind of happen through ether. They weren't brought about by the Conservatives at all, whose real ambition is just to sell off the NHS to Donald Trump or whatever it is. Um, and so uh, con co concurrently, you've had a situation where all, all the political battles since 2014 have been lost by the left. Uh, so I think 10 years ago, uh, let's start with the Scottish referendum. That was the big one. And, and that was also the first election that kind of tore the country. It was like a, a pre-shock to an earthquake or a pre-tremor. Uh, where we saw how that sort of tore Scotland apart, you know, tore families apart, created this kind of, or, or it showed us this kind of vicious cybernat trolling um, culture, you know, which which sort of helped drive people like Charles Kennedy to their deaths, and um, the that that was won by the sort of conservative side, you know, uh, even though it's more broad coalition than that then the twenty fifteen election. I mean, I remember reading Guardian articles where people said, I cried every day for a week after that election. Then, of course, you have Brexit. Uh, the, you know, then the, the 2017 election, which I suppose their kind of version of a win. Then 2019, obviously, the huge Boris uh, win. Um, mixed into that Trump in 2016. Um, and so I think that they want to push things like higher immigration and more progressive social policies as a kind of punishment on the electorate. Um, and it's lots of minor sort of um, minor policies, even to take something like the, the National Trust. So the inhabitants of that will see it as their duty to educate their kind of gamony um, customers. Um, and, so, and so that's why, you know, instead of, you know, teaching us where this mahogany chess came from it's more about kind of lecturing us on sort of gay rights when you go around some manor house um and it, it's this cumulative sort of death by a thousand cuts which creates this huge pressure likewise you know steve edgington has done lots of work on revealing kind of wokeness in the civil service and how the home office staff very deliberately obstruct any kind of attempt to inhibit immigration from the, uh, that comes from the government. Um, and so effectively, fundamentally, the reason I'm not a woke centrist Moreno is I don't think those policies work. I don't think they create a, a good, healthy society. But those are the policies that are being brought in. And that's why we get the sense that everything is getting worse, because uh, power, I think, is ever, ever, ever more being taken away from the electorate, from Parliament and more in the hands of NGOs. I mean, even the Office of Budget Responsibility, which wasn't that like a George Osborne creation, was effectively something that can be filled, an organisation that can be filled with left-wing economists to criticise conservative budgets. Mm. You know, it's insane that a conservative party would bring that in. So at every stage, hands, hands are tied. And, you know, when Labour come in, it'll be worse because they're going to continue this mode citizens assemblies or soviets where there can only be one true voice that will uh only only one true answer will be accepted in much the same way that blair held referendums that he knew he would win and that he thought would create further labor control in in scotland and london hmm. yeah okay so let's get into well yes we may be guilty of inverse gretarism and sort of doomerism in our bubble and that's what i was wondering last night i was thinking or is this just me? Do I just feel this way? And people walking around without this sense of despair. Certainly some of the normies I, I speak to, the, as I say, my football team, yeah, they, they have a different sense of despair, which is just Brexit, just simply Brexit. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the big problem in it, and it's incompetence. And we've lost money because of that. And that's it. Other people definitely are going around with this feeling. And I do sometimes wonder if the elite have just even messed up on immigration, that even they didn't realise, like, they like how radical it, it was. And I just got this sense that, oh, we've messed up here maybe but but they're, then again they're probably going to carry on doing it but i just think i wonder if even they meant meant it to get this extreme this quick well, they're, but, they're probably they probably received the same kind of warnings about demographic change that elon musk worries about but you know that their, their versions simply won't work because 
lots of migrants, probably the majority coming to the UK, vastly probably are not a, a, a fiscal tax benefit, right, especially yeah. when only fifty percent, fifteen percent of visas granted last year were for actual work, and um, further to that, um, it, it creates a greater strain on public services. And the only solution that they believe is is more migration because there's this idea that migrants are sort of, sort of little wealth factories, mm. um, which I just don't think the evidence bears yeah. out at all. Because of the GDP of the country, but, it's, but it doesn't improve GBT, GBP per capita. Yeah, it brings it down. And also, yeah, they don't have skills mainly, blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. And it's a Ponzi scheme, as Dr. Paul Mullen has said on this podcast, it's unsustainable. Yeah, they, they may be concerned about the birth rate. They haven't told us if they are really. And the dependency rate, they're definitely concerned about that. Imagine Matthew Paris's article. Well, also, the other day. One, one key thing, another argument that refutes that as well is that migrants' birth, migrant birth rates will tend to regress to the mean of the country that they're in within a generation or two. Yes, that's also so true. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it, just, it, it doesn't just, work. And on, they yeah. get old. Yeah, the whole thing doesn't work. The idea we can keep plugging it. As Dr. Paul Mullen has said many times, you've got the three E's egotism, ethnic continuity, economic growth. Egotism, he just means it's a standing word, meaning not having kids because you're selfish. But he doesn't mean it in a rude way. Ethic continuity, economic growth. He says you can have two, but not all three. And, 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 and that's what's happened. Japan has chosen ethnic continuity and egotism, so they don't have economic growth. We've chosen egotism and economic growth, so we don't have ethnic continuity. We've destroyed our culture as we know it, etc. So it's quite a clever formulation. Um, um, been quite useful but me i've got two kids so there we right. go i'm doing my part you're doing your bit and i'm not i'm just a hypocrite but i'm trying to at least preach about it so i can suddenly <laughs> hear myself echoing on your mic there the last thing we need is two me's which is why i haven't reproduced um, <laughs> but, um i see <laughs> thinking the, on your feet there. the wits like in that. place as always um <laughs> and you, another couple of things you mentioned cameron and his and his gay marriage have you actually posted the other day i'm sure you saw the that was one of his most proud <laughs> moments proud was gay he married he's still yeah. on about it what an absolute loser but also, another couple of things, the civil service. Yeah, well, this seems like a good time to get into my post, which, sorry for the self-indulgence, but it's just, a, it's, just a, it's just a talking point, everyone. It's not that I think it's so great. Occasionally, I'll do a, a prescient banger. I've started to think of them as. Mm. And I did one the other night, a few weeks ago. It got 10,000 likes, blew up, got accused of doomerism, but it, it really struck a chord. That one that, that was basically was like how everything's over, and it got 10,000 likes, suggesting a lot of people do feel like that. This one was different. It's only got 1,000 likes, but it's still sort of a nerd. I said... My current feeling is that under Labour, it will be, essentially become illegal to be conservative or right-wing if it isn't already. GB News will be attacked more relentlessly than ever, perhaps shut down. Obviously, YouTube bans will continue. More right-wing people will be dropped from political parties and fired from jobs. Some will go to prison. We've already seen that, of course. If the economy improves, people will accept the lack of freedom, somewhat like China. And I really meant economy and services. If not, Labour won't last long and a populist leader will take over. But they won't be able to do much, though, and we'll, we'll continue our descent into becoming a third-world country. So, and then I added that actually Labour could weirdly improve things. The Tories are not able or not allowed to fix, e.g. high taxes, health, defence. Uh, but they don't seem to want to tackle immigration, hence that second scenario. So this is a question. I mean, this is kind of what you talked about with the civil service. They will actually enact some policy. I mean, I speak to these people and the yeah. blob and the extended blob and the Bank of England and all these places, and they know, they will, they'll enact policies from Starmer that they wouldn't, from Boris, and would try and block, as you said. And we know that the Home Office blocked Swella Bravman and so on. So Starmer, weirdly, if he wants to, can get some stuff done, possibly, where he goes like, I'm going to be ruthless Starmer, influenced by Blair, and I'm going to improve defence spending, I'm going to cut taxes. I mean, economically, he inherits a very difficult position, but he could be like, right, I'm going to reform the health service, which Tories can't do because they're nasty. By the way, that thing you said about axiomatic anti-Toryism, someone replied to my thing saying, or one of my tweets saying, the Tories are the nasty party and always will be. It's almost like whatever yeah. they do, they'll just always yeah. be the nasty party, however radically left yeah. they are. And um, Whereas just that AA tweet that I referenced, by the way, academic agent, just really quickly was, he said, Blair viewed from the vantage point of 2024, looks like Tories driving at the speed limit. The 10 to 24 Tories are the most extreme radical leftist party ever to hold power in this country, which is interesting. So the Tories will all be, already be seen as nasty, always be seen as nasty. So therefore, Labour can get stuff done on health that they can't. Mm. Uh, talk about the NHS reform, which where Streeting talks about. They could get ruthless on various things. I've not heard enough about immigration, though people were replying to me saying they might actually lower it under Labour, which is possible. 
So do you think my sort of uh, analysis there could be accurate, that Labour will continue to sort of censor opposition and it'll get even harder to do the things we do, but at the same time, they could actually fix some pragmatic things. So we'll have a kind of China where the Chinese people were like, okay, we've been brought out of poverty, so we'll accept that we live in oppression. There was a sort of an element, will there be an element of that with Starmer, a kind of oppressive but somewhat efficient country, or will it just completely go to shit? Uh, so on the aspect of censoring things and making it harder, yes, that's definitely going to happen. Obviously, the Nargooch made a very good point in the piece he wrote about those, those citizen assemblies, about how the goal of left-wing politics is to make right-wing politics impossible. Uh, and sort of banning and censoring is one of the levers that government have. I think in terms of primarily improving the things, I think they won't improve anything. I think everything will get much worse. I think they're physically capable of it. I think Starmer's is completely incompetent. You can, you know, he'd struggle to open the paper bag. Um, and, uh, you know, he looks weird. He talks funny. He's clearly got to his positions because he's good at meetings, as most of these people do, rather than having any kind of talent or skill. Um, and you know, there's a sort of wider point on why governments reach for things like bans. Uh, so this is one thing the Tories have done a lot. You know, they're going to ban smoking, they're uh, inhibiting vaping, um, and they've banned all sorts of things. It's because when bureaucratic inertia makes government governing impossible, uh, rather than fixing that problem, which is very difficult and time-consuming and involves, you know, basically... Uh, making the civil service do things for you, which they don't want to do because they're lazy um, or ideologically opposed to, then the only thing is to uh, pile on more laws, even though, you know, it, the real problem is laws not being enforced. So examples that are, they're talking about laws about protests, but, you know, there's many laws that could be called upon to, to uh, shut down these hate marches, but, uh, you know, the police won't do them because the police are concerned with public order rather than the rights of the individual. And, um, you know, can even lay, you know, go back a few years, we talk about, say, the upskirting law. Now, I don't approve of the upskirting. I think people who do it should probably go to, should definitely go to prison. Um, but the. What is it? Just, is, it is it taking pictures or just looking at up someone's skirt or do I you think, take a I picture? I don't know. I, I, think, I think it's taking pictures. But the point is, is that there's innumerable, I mean, there's probably like four or five laws you could use to, 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 dab, to put someone away for that. Um, but they they don't use them, so they sort of create this more an, an additional law that sort of serves no purpose. It's just a kind of virtue signaling exercise uh, to do something that the police are already empowered to do anyway. It makes no utter sense. And I mean, criminal justice more broadly, um, you know, much of the legal establishment is actively pro crime, so that's why you know. You can murder somebody, and get four years out in two. I mean, an, an interesting point on that. This is a bit of an aside: is that when you, uh, it, it, so there was a story recently where they said, "Watch gang nicked," and and it said, you know, fourteen gang members have been put away for a total of thirty-four years in this big sort of watch stealing gang sting that the police did. And we read that and think, oh, terrific, great, you know, it's criminals off the streets, police cunningly getting them, fantastic. And you think of, and it, 34 years sounds a lot, and you think, well, hang on a minute, 34 years divided by 14 people is like two and two and a bit years apiece. And then remember, everybody's automatically out after half their sentence. So all these people terrorizing the streets will be back on the streets by this time next year. Yeah. So, so, so it sounds like that like, you think, oh, 34 years. No, 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 no. Like, you're in a bit, mate. And, yeah. then and we can also cite way worse examples of rapists basically not going to prison, not even going to prison at all. Whereas Sam Melia goes to prison for two years for telling some people they might want to post stickers, whatever you think of him. So, yeah, yeah it's a pure you know, anarcho tyranny. Uh, That's the anarcho tyranny. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if you look at Starmer's record as DPP, it was horrendous. You know, I, I, I had his number marked. I think in 2009, when the newspaper seller, Ian Tomlinson, I think his name was, uh, had a heart attack and died after being pushed to the floor by some thug policemen during those, these anti-globalist globalization protests. And I remember very clearly the press conference, the Starmer going, unfortunately, we have determined that there is no evidence to pursue this at this matter, so we will not be pursuing a prosecution. I'm like, man, 
There's a video of the guy pushing him to the ground. How much more evidence do you need? What are you talking about? And at that moment, I realized, you know what? You're just another establishment person covering up for people. You've got, you're completely incapable of making anything better. You know, when, when his reaction to sort of sex crime as DPP was to just lower standards of probity rather than actually have people do their, do their work. I know it wasn't even that. It was, it was something like you know, success will just be measured in convictions rather than whether they're sound or not. It, it, it was really bad. It was bad law. It was, it was bad practice all round. So I think, yeah, you know, he goes around the world rubbish. as well, campaigning against the death penalty, getting vicious murderers let off a guy, a guy who buried his stepson alive or something. There was a guy who murders his wife brutally. There's all these people like in Uganda and all these places that just brutal murders and Starmer's been campaigning to get them all let off the death penalty. And he was successful in many cases. There was one who mm-hmm. slaughtered a BBC uh, presenter where he wasn't successful in getting them off, but he did in, in many cases. And yet, as I pointed out in my Lotus Eater segment, wants to bring euthanasia in, in this country, which he will. So he's very pro death of innocent people, but he's anti death of violent well, murders. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, this you'll probably regard me as this is a completely woolly liberal statement, but I'm, I'm also against the death penalty, but at least I'm consistent on it because I, I don't support euthanasia either. But yeah, that's the sort I of think... liberal Kevin Yule position. <laughs> yeah. But the, I mean, but the issue with that is that if you're a public figure, if you're a politician in, in the UK, then you shouldn't be going around other countries campaigning in how their legal systems operate. It's just completely inappropriate. Yeah, it's um, crazy. But, anyway, but sorry, it. go he'll, on. He won't, he'll never get called up for that. I and mean, that, that's another aspect of the left is, that he, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, contiguously this Angela Rayner story. The BBC or whatever, they don't care about that, even though she's in a very, very difficult position legally and has some serious questions to answer. Notice how I'm dancing around the... <laughs> yeah, it happened on the front <laughs> page as well. Him. Obviously, yeah. the hypocrisy charge after attacking Rishi Sunak's wife for the non-DOM status. Now she's got this thing with capital gains tax and council tax yeah. benefit and electoral rules as well. It's, it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's pure. There's There's no semblance that there's any kind of balance anymore that they uh if, if you're sort of vaguely left of center then you can sort of get away with anything you can see it in the way that conservative mps are criticized for presenting on gb news but labor mps are not for being on lbc it's, and it's presenters on GB news, we're going to end up with so many hit pieces we're going to end up with um just left-wing presenters left on gb which is why i listed gb as one of my things obviously it's tricky for me to get into but Yes, will GB even be allowed under Labour? As and you're saying, just more and more, yeah, more and more persecution on the Starmer. But you say they I'm, won't I'm get anything I'd good be done. I'm surprised either. if GP GB make it through the five years. If I'm being honest, I think that they'll probably find some way of giving Ofcom some more teeth. Um, and you know, it, it might not be the stated aim of Labour ministers, but within the echelons of the civil service and the Labour Party more generally, they'll be working out how to shut GB down. If you look at um, various people on, on X, I can't remember what that guy's name is, he's just obsessed with GB News. There's many, um, don't worry. Yeah, I mean, the world stopped funding Hayes, you know, who were campaigning to get shut down before it even broadcast a minute. Yeah, you and know, there's it, obviously Matthew Sweet and Alan Ruz, yeah, yeah. whatever, the heck. there's so many. Yeah, I mean, they're obsessed with it. For some strange reason, and well, we know, so they can completely control political discourse. I mean, they don't even mind that it's so obvious. They would shut it down and just be openly Maoist. They don't even care at this point, do they? And that's that's a, quite a frightening thing in a way. And yes, we're I mean, just going to have. Actually, go if I could, if I could come in on that being openly Maoist, I think that perhaps one of the, if you want to think about what a Starmer government would look like simply look to the other English-speaking countries like Ireland, Canada. Wales, yeah. um, to an extent, you know, whatever it does. Scotland, We're recording this just as the hate crime laws come in. Yeah, exactly. You know, this it's an absurdity. Um, I think that and this is sort of where the counter to elite theory comes in, even though I, I do think there's loads of, it's a very important way to understand things. I think that what, does happen is that people are able to bring in their pet projects and the political uh, within people within positions of influence with NGOs, civil services, civil services, etc. Um, they just have these woke pet projects. I mean, you meet these people; they're completely mental. Um, and the the leader in power at the time just assumes, oh, that that that's us. You know, Hamza Yusuf probably hasn't doesn't care about 
the sort of legal implications of the hate crime law. He just thinks, oh, that's hate. And, and there's a huge, you know, there's, there's a, there has been a sort of top down driven moral panic about hate over the last 10 years. And I think that's broadly driven by a kind of recognition that the, the counter terrorism political infrastructure sort of targets Muslims um, uh, disproportionately. So there's this thought of, well, we need to be going after kind of far right or, you know, ethno nationalists, identitarians, all the rest of it. Um, but again, you know, they run into the supply and demand problem. They so they go end up going after Lotus Eaters and GB News. Yeah, I mean, Dawn Butler just tweeted yesterday or ex posted it's important that we do not allow hate to win. And this was in relation to transgender day of visibility. I said, I wonder when we'll know that we've defeated hate. As far as I'm aware, we're still working on terror. I mean, when you launch wars on these things, it's so absurd, isn't it? And on the Scottish bill, of course, we've seen this guy, what's his name? Not Humza, but the other guy. There's a clip going around today where he's just saying white. It's very similar to the Humza Yusuf video. He keeps saying, oh, the, these people are all white. Why? The, the head of police, blah, 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 white. And it's like, you're in Scotland, mate? It's uh, 98 95% white, whatever it is. It's like 98% of Japanese bakers, Japanese. Why? It's like <laughs> that stupid. It's like, because you're in Scotland, bro. What's the guy called? It's uh, he's he's called Anwar something. Anyway, that's been going around today. Oh yeah, that and, guy. And people have been recording it. People have been reporting him under law because, of course, if you took it seriously, he would be breaking that law. Uh, it's Anas Sawa. There's yeah. just uh, speech going oh, around. He's, he's the Labour leader. Labour, um, yeah, Labour. Like yeah. like said that. But yeah, just on the on elite theory, one thing that's been fascinating me about that, and people should listen if they haven't yet for some crazy reason to my episode with Academic Agent where he went yeah, all, yeah, all the way through everyone it. Should. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, it's, he's great. And and we and we broke it. Someone said it was the most clear distillation of his ideas they've heard, so there you go. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing that I'm struggling with is, is how far you need the consent of the people. Because he said to me, I can't remember if he said it in that, but he, he said to me since, you always need the tacit consent of the people. And that's where I'm sort of struggling, not struggling to understand, but I, I think I sort of grasp it. But essentially the elites come in, they do what they want. They can only be replaced by a counter elite. The will of the people is a myth. Uh, but he said to me, every ruling class, regardless of system, has the tacit consent of the ruled. And if that's lost, they'll be overthrown. However, if the ruling class has a will not to be overthrown, things get tricky. So, And the key is the non-governing elite. So the, the civil service we talked about, you always have these two stratas Pareto, Moscow, they, they always talk about these two, they use different terms, but you've got the ruling class, which is the politicians and so on, but then you've also got below that the people who actually enact it, which is the civil service and all those other people, the extended blob, the deep state, and the normal, the blob and the extended blob, the deep state in America it was called. So they are crucial, but there is this level to where, okay, they ignore voters, they don't care, but if it gets too bad, then something has to be done. That's kind of where I feel we are or heading towards. So my thing with Labour is how far will Starmer be smart enough to go, things are going to get so out of hand, I've got to actually address these things the Tories wouldn't, such as immigration. Or is he, like you say, just too incompetent? He's not Blair. He's just incompetent and an idiot. He'll also be pressured by the extremities of his party. So, you know, you you can tell when the election's rolling around because Labour start cracking out the Union Jacks and then their own supporters start saying, oh, this fascist imagery... (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of funny. there's a whole piece about that in the paper. I've got it here, actually. Uh, it was about Keir Starmer faces discontent, this is obvious observer, as Labour MPs reject Union Jack election flyers. I mean, how cranky is your own party? They're like, I can't even, I simply can't give these out. But they're just ignoring that. And yeah, Starmer's doing his gestures about, we shouldn't replace the England flag and think, you know, on that, mm-hmm. that, that, that flag that looked like the bisexual flag on the England shirt from Nike. Now he's got these Union Jacks. So he will do the minimal appearance of not hating the country but his own party as you say hate well, the Blair, country Blair and Brown would do that so they would come up with British jobs for British workers and things like that um you know that they, they they would make noise I mean I think in pretty much every manifesto they they would promise to bring immigration down so I think they 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 Starm is probably cognizant of what he needs to win over the median voter but you know, I, I can't see any change. I mean, I, I can see trans rules being 
trans policy being more entrenched. I can see more censorship. Uh, I can see more hate crime legislation. I can see uh, potentially the uh, current mob panic about processed food becoming more entrenched. I mean, it's already pretty pretty hardcore now. You know, under the Conservative government, you know, sugar taxes, all the rest of it, bans on buy one, get one freeze. And since none of that stuff is effective, then the uh, at bringing down obesity, then the, the the demand will just be for more of the same because that's that's how politics works. Mm. Yes, and what about my the second part of my prophecy? And I just get these little feelings and vibes. They don't. They're just feelings, guys. They don't necessarily mean that. They sort of. I see my posts more as kind of art. They're not necessarily mm. predictions. They just come to me because I'm an artist. <laughs> but my second point that they they won't be able to do much though. Oh yeah, if not, if the economy is bad and things don't actually improve in any way, the populist leader will take over. Who also won't be able to do much. So I was being ultra pessimistic. But you know that's where your Farage comes in. The danger is he just comes in and says, "I don't care. I'm eating Easter eggs. I don't care what anyone says. I'm, I've eaten six today and I've smoked a cigar and they can say what they like. You know, because that's the sort of useless part of Farage. They kind of like." Look at me smoking a cigar and eating an Easter egg because he's he become so moderate now. It becomes a kind of mm. gesturism, which Trump can also fall into and nothing really changes, but it's just kind of like, you know, triggering the libs. I see a sort of triggering the libs populist coming in at that point, but the country's too far gone. I mean, what can they really do? They won't have the civil service on their side. Well, Will okay, they be, even be allowed in or get in? I don't know. Well, OK, let me I'll come back on that with the Farage debanking scandal. Now. Whatever you where you cut that, that was an absolute win for Nigel. He yeah. dominated now, and, and 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 how absolutely, you know, it c- couldn't have gone better for him. They they grovelingly apologise. They're forced to reassess the whole thing. He's you know, I, I I think he's kind of building some kind of thing to sort of fight for other people who've who've had that happen. They just certainly had a lot of people contact him about it, and um. There was a Conservative MP who was also debanked. Oh, I forget the name. Someone can look it up. Just you know, do that. Um, but I thought, isn't isn't that amazing? You know, Nigel was debanked, and you know he fought back, and the chief executive had to step down. That's that's how that's how viciously he fought back, and, and brilliantly. It was it was such it was brilliant. I was so and. A Tory MP, the party of government gets debanked, and they're like, oh, "What are you going to do?" You know, didn't do yes. anything. You know, his his own government didn't get behind him. You know, if he'd gone to one, yeah. of, I don't know who who were the prime ministers during the who was his prime minister when this happened, but obviously they wouldn't give a shit. He can be very effective. Obviously, he was massively instrumental in Brexit. Maybe the most important person. Um, like you said, the debanking scandal. Anything he wants to get done and really puts his mind to, whether he wants to come back, we don't know. He talked about he'd rather do the trade job to America, although Starmer would never ask him. And you look at the way reform are behaving. I know he's not sort of running it at the moment. And we can talk about that in a minute. They dropped their candidates, although they've now defended their candidates a bit against the mail on Sunday, finally realizing they're not going to have any left if they listen to all these hit pieces. So he, so now he's so moderate, Farage. I mean, and it's partly his stick now. I mean, I love Farage. Now. He's a colleague of mine, but he's just so moderate. I wonder if he came in, let's say somehow he manages to be leader through the Tories or reform or something else after the Labour collapse, which I have predicted in another, uh, earlier, another one of my prophetic posts, that he'll come in, Labour will come in, it'll be so bad, they'll only last five years, Farage 2029 or whatever. But, um, but would he be able to do anything? Much as Trump wasn't able to do much because of the deep state, how would Farage work with a, a civil service that despises him? Well... I mean, I think it's such an academic conversation because he's so he'll never get near power um, in the first really? past post. Not in the first past post system. He's not going to join the Tories. He's not going to, you know, reform aren't going to get any seats. Um, even if he campaigns, I'd be skeptical if they could. And then the question is, you know, who's his chief of staff going to be? Who's you know who who's those who are the people who are going to help him grab the levers of power? You know, I, I think it would be. It, you know, that would be taken away from him uh, in much the same way that, yeah, you brought up Trump and I think Cummings wrote Trump sort of did it in the worst possible way because he said he would drain the swamp, but all he did was make it angry. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, with the Supreme Court, he did actually get stuff done. Of course, that led to the 
Abortion law, which some people say lost the midterm. That, that's but... handed to him, though, because that's <laughs> sort of, you know, it's the prerogative of the president to pick the, pick the judges. And he had, uh, you know, retirement and a death. So, bang, he could just do that. Yes. But it, was, the, it, was, it wasn't... Well, that, uh, that, the Tories wouldn't have done it. On I mean... a silver platter, an opportunity to affect change. It's not something that you actually have to dig through. Yeah, but think uh, about how spot. they attacked Kavanaugh relentlessly and, and, and some of the others not quite as relentlessly. Think about how the toys were just folded and then stuck in some lefty. He oh, still had to stick man. to his guns. Yeah. But what yeah, will true. happen then? I mean, what will happen? Because because the toys are going to get obliterated as we started with. 98 seats, all these different predictions. They're not even trying to win anymore, it says in the article. They're just trying to not lose that many seats. Yeah. What What is going to happen? Are the toys going to be finished? Are they going to break up? Because if they break up, that's where Farage can come in. You get Patel, you get Truss, you get Kruger and Miriam Cates. All these people leave, and and there's a, there's a new party, and then the other Tories are the One Nation Libtard Party. I mean, I don't know. Or do you see it not not happening? Um, I think you know when you tend to have splits, um, they tend to just fade away. You know, look at the SDP in in the early eighties. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I think there's another matter here which is quite is worth going into is that. In order to win elections, you need to be good at the mechanics of electioneering. Um, And I have not seen evidence that reform are any good at that. And likewise, a breakaway party, because you need people to knock on doors. But it's not just that. You need to sort of delineate all your wards, the streets in the wards. You need to have the get out the vote thing. You ever ever done that where... um, my mom asked me to help her do it once. It's like you you knock on doors and then you get them to say they'll vote for you. And then at the polling station, you tick off the people as they come through who've said they'll vote for you. And if they've not come round by sort of the afternoon, you literally send people round their houses <laughs> to knock on the door and be like, come on, let's vote. You need that. You know, you need to be able to marshal that. And you know, one, one thing I've learned through seeing... Sort of mainstream politics and distant politics is that the distant right just doesn't have that. You know, they can shoot a good video, they can, you know, make a bit of a splash on Twitter, but that simple bread and butter electioneering, uh, which the Tories and Labour are good at, and also for both the Conservatives and Labour, their party structures are essentially they function as social clubs. There's something for boomers to do, you know, the odd strange millennial or, or zuma um who you know who will be the army that you need and uh reform have a lot of supporters around the country but in arts you know the, 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 but they clearly don't have that and that explains the disparity between them getting 15 and 60 percent in the polls but not getting near a seat not even coming second anywhere mm. by the way I resent you calling Rory a strange Zoomer, but can I just say the... Um, Did I mention the, Rory? No, no, you just said um, the odd strange millennial or Zoomer who goes and does this political stuff. And it's stuff. funny that you, you immediately thought of Rory. Sorry, yeah, Rory. Yeah, that yeah. That was yeah, him, yeah. not me. Because he goes out and does... <laughs> he gets on the doors. <laughs> he was out there trying to get more people to vote up in uh, Rotherham, I think, wasn't he? But um, so... No, we're just having a little oh, thing at Rory because he's good not lad. here. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting you say that reform don't get all that. What did you make of them being a little bit tougher on this attack from the Mail on Sunday where they went through all Reform's candidates? Tom Howard, for some reason, has been obsessed with it on X. And he says, meet some of Reform UK's candidates. And that's kind of how he talks, isn't it? Convicted animal abuser, barred from owning a dog. I'll stop doing the voice. Fortune teller who sold mystic psychic readings on OnlyFans. David Icke fan who claimed Zionism puts agents in places of power. And a former councillor booted out for claiming the whole anti-Semitism thing is a false flag. Conspiracy theorist who claims the pandemic was an illusion and had been planned by the governments in 2016. Crank who claims the COVID vaccine was the greatest crime against humanity. And he says they need to get serious about vetting. I mean, it's true they don't do any vetting. I mean, I mean even Bo said that on Lotus. Well, Gary, you need the mechanics of that. Don't, it's another aspect, the mechanics of electioneering that is not available to them. Right. But then he's, they don't do any vetting. It's what I've seen, candidates have said that to me that, but yeah, they, they didn't really ask me anything. It was all very, just like, have you, do you have a criminal record? And that was about it. Mm. But um, but Tice has defended all these, which he didn't do before. He said things like, any parent would defend their child from vicious dog attack. 
the attacking dog owner apologized and did not want charges pressed. So this guy is, seems like he was protecting his kids and they said, well, you can't own a dog anymore. He said, fine, fine. Jackie is Jewish. She was cleared of anti-Semitism by the Tory party. What's wrong with earning money legally as a fortune teller? <laughs> so he's going through all the uh, all the claims. Yeah. But then he's, he sort of tailed off after that point. Um, <laughs> he didn't defend all the other ones, though. He did. He said, if you don't think there have been serious vaccine harms, then you're deeply misinformed. Oh, yeah. Just but because the... you're the male or son did not agree with someone sharing a post does not mean they're not suitable as a parliamentary candidate. We've all said so that. Thought, I thought that was interesting God. because, very strangely, after the bow... I suppose debacle is the only phrase you could use. Um, he shared when a day got dropped by reform just for the listeners yeah, when, in case they missed it. Exactly. Yes. And then when, uh, so the, a few days ago, he shared an article that Douglas Murray had written about hope, not hate criticizing them about from a month ago. Yeah. And I thought well, that was interesting. That was and bizarre. So possibly he's realized that, I mean, I would imagine that among the network, uh, of the ref- reform network is what's happened to Bo has gone down like a cup of cold sick. Uh, they've probably been inundated by emails from their supporters and their candidates. And this is him sticking up for them, which is yes, yeah, fair enough. I mean, you should stick up for your people. And I think that, I mean, from Harwood's position, it just seems, I mean, if, if you were sort of setting yourself up to be a Tory MP, would you act any differently? No, exactly. I mean, that's that's it, I suppose. Fair enough. It's, it's, it's career stuff. But in terms of Tice, yeah, it's, he did share that post about saying that hope not hate tactics were sinister and they should be called hate not hope. He was like superb from Douglas Murray. And everyone's like, what? You, you just you just got rid of candidates because of a hope not hate hit piece. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, maybe he's learning. And he's certainly yeah. now the Mail on Sunday doing it and he's gone, oh, I'll be left with no candidates here if I don't defend some of them. It's just mm. it's so obvious. But... Maybe you can choose which ones to defend, but if you don't defend any of them, you'll have no candidates because the left will do hit pieces on all of them. Yeah. So, it's, it's tricky to find the people. It's, it's very hard. I mean, to be a candidate, um, there's a really good book called Why We Get the Wrong Politicians by Isabel Hardman, and I think in it she says to be a to be to stand seriously stand as MP costs something like thirty thousand pounds, thirty five thousand, something like that. Wow. Um, that could and be so. Yeah, I right. think. Yeah, I, I might have to run quickly. Let me just check something. How long are we going for? Fifty-six oh, minutes. Yeah, I've got to go soon. Uh, in the next few minutes. So okay, um, well, we'll wrap it yeah. up. I was gonna. Funny thing is, last night I was thinking, I don't know what to do about this this country, and I thought maybe I need to fix it, Alex. I didn't know it cost thirty-five grand. Though. Someone did speak to me once. He said, "I can I can tell you how to become an MP if you want." Who's who is involved? But I was thinking, man, the, imagine all the stuff you have to do to get anywhere. And then by then you've completely lost it. You just you turn into Starmer. But we need people like me, really. Of course, they'd go through all my podcasts saying, well, you said women can't vote, blah, blah. You know, it'd be, it'd be a disaster. But don't you think we need someone like me to save the country? Yeah, yeah, I'd vote for you, of course. <laughs> Thanks. But you, um, we're never going to get in. But like you say, because this, the process is, is impossible, right? Yeah, I mean, it, we will be. Um, and it's... It's a very, very difficult process, but I suppose on the other hand, it has its advantages. I mean, proportional representation could also be a nightmare. I mean, the whole thing, I mean, you know, politics in general is just sort of, it's a, even in a functioning political system, it's still a dog's dinner. Yeah. Okay. Well, since you've got to go, anything you want to well, plug? Um, well, actually, we could, I just want to touch very briefly on this Matthew Paris thing. Okay. Um, because the article about wrote, euthanasia. Yeah. Um, I think that um, I'm very against euthanasia and it's because I know full well that if it was brought in, A, there'd be a slippery slope and you start killing children and you start killing people with mental problems, which is exactly what's happening in Canada and the Holland. And also you would be in a situation where family members would pressure their loved ones to die um, so that they could get their money so they wouldn't be a burden. And euthanasia... Um, advocates always claim, oh no, um, that wouldn't possibly happen. And I thought that Matthew Paris ar- article is is that that's the argument he's that's ex- precisely the, the argument he's making on a macro level. He's saying it will happen and it's good, yeah. which is extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. But it, he's saying that uh, the quiet part out loud to use that phrase 
And and pro euthanasia people have said, "Oh, this is terrible from Paris. This is ruined, set back a, a noble cause." Someone said, "Some I think it was it might have been an MP." I was like, "A noble cause." Yeah, I'll give you a little quote from the piece. He said, um, "Your time is up. Will never be in order, but yes, the objectors are right. It may one day be the kind of unspoken hint that everybody understands, and that's a good thing." He's saying that eventually you get to the point you're old, you're ill. People say, "Shouldn't you really just off yourself?" And he's saying that it'll, it'll become taboo not to do that. It's one of the most extraordinary. Pe- it's just like I called it evil. It's just an openly evil piece. It's saying mm. that people become a burden, and we should off them as quickly as possible. I mean, and because of the economy, we can't afford them, and it should become normal to just off them. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, Canada exactly. Does he know about the 41 year old woman who cited fibromyalgia, but but actually secretly said it was because she was poor and was euthanized? Does he know about the autistic man who's being bullied and said he was unhappy, euthanized by Canada? 13,500 deaths in 2022. It's over 4% of their deaths that year done by the state in this so-called made, sinisterly named kind of oh my kind God. of program. Well, that's what we're going to have. People are so stupid if they don't see this coming. There's the ethical arguments. I can make the Christian arguments that no one cares about. Some people care. Liberal atheist humanists like Kevin Yule care. But they're harder to make to the average secular materialist. But the slippery slope argument, just look at Canada. It's just going to be, to quote Trump, a bloodbath, but an actual bloodbath. It's just going to kill everyone, as you've said. Well, it's, it's yeah, I, I think it's, you know, I did, people don't know, I did this film with Steve Edgerton uh, called Canada's Woke Nightmare last year. And, you know, we met a woman who was disabled, um, ex-military, and she was trying to get a stair lift installed in her house. over so like 10 years she was waiting and they said, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. We can't really do your, oh, this Canadian. Hey, we can't really do your stair lift, eh? But uh, have you thought about killing yourself? And that's just kind of what the conversation was. And um, just before I go, I, I just want to have a dig at um, Matthew Paris because I just think he's just an abhorrent human being. But a month or two ago, he gave, maybe a bit more, he gave an, uh, an interview with the, Sunday ta- with the Times, Times Online, Times TV, whatever it was. And he was sort of saying that he wants to leave the Tory party because it's become horrible and good conservatives are, um, you know, are, are being forced to leave the party. And he was making it as if this, it was some kind of moral issue. It was clearly just resentment over Brexit, at which he was just one of the worst commentators. And so I, I sort of had a look at conservative MPs who were MPs when he was there. So I, the people that he thought was acceptable, it, he, he actually name checked Nicholas Soames. Now Nicholas Soames was um, <sighs> he was accused by several female MPs of making vulgar comments about them, miming their breaths when they would sit down, making woofing noises at Tanzim Ahmed Sheikh. Um, he was um, being forced forced to apologise for the speaker described as as discourteous and the expression should not be used. Uh, he tried to claim tax relief on some furniture by claiming that his flat was available for public viewing. Uh, Mark Thomas said about him, um, I tried to find the good in my enemies. It's not unusual to be able to get on with people despite what they're do- doing being awful. The only person I've met who I consider to be without any redeeming features was Nicholas Soames. He was such a pantomime baddie. So for Matthew Paris, he was fine. Like He's a good Tory. You know, uh, Cecil Parkinson... The man who had an affair with his secretary, which resulted in a daughter who had severe disabilities, who he never met or even acknowledged. Uh, we talk about Terry Dix, who was the MP for Hayes and Harlington, who um, he regarding Derek Gregory, a mentally subnormal man who was sentenced to death in Malaysia for drug smuggling. Dix said he would be writing to the Malaysian government congratulating it on its approach. Of Faza Bazoff, an observer journalist hanged by Saddam Hussein in 1990, Dix said he deserved to be hanged on the eve of his execution. Uh, Dix, <laughs> during the HIV AIDS awareness campaigns, uh, uh, Dix said, as an example of um, a potential awareness campaign that could be run, he suggested, tell him that if you shove your willy up someone's bum, you're going to catch more than the cold. For Matthew Paris, these were good Tories, <laughs> right? But it's all these all people like Andrew Jenkins and the Anderson who've never done anything remotely. They're actually, you know, I've I've met Andrea, she's a really nice person, not met Lee, but I've heard he's really fun. Um they're they're bad. And simply because they support Brexit. And I one thing I despise about this sort of 
this kind of contiguous rump centrist conservative party is this claim that they have morals and they absolutely have none. Yeah, I mean, Soames is the grandson of uh, Churchill, isn't he? So he's going to be probably a little bit entitled. But speaking of Paris then, and the, and the, which Tories, are, and how he's a sort of a Tory, sort of the worst of the Tories, Dominic Cummings had a great piece on this. He said, on brand that a pundit, uh, an ex-post, on brand that a pundit banging the heart of Tory establishment now campaigns to kill all people to save money. It's a logical development for the rancid party. Anti-growth, higher taxes, let out the worst criminals, surrender to a few dinghies, vandalise critical capabilities, encourage Ministry of Defence corruption, cheer on the trans child abuse madness, collapse the emergency health system. Then when you're about to be destroyed by voters, tell them the old must be killed to save taxes for the Tory <laughs> rentiers. <laughs> I mean, is there anything to disagree with in that, honestly? That was based <laughs> on comedy. Perfect. It is based. It's, hashtag it's close amazing. the Tories. Hashtag start up party 2025. Yeah. Right. I'm so sorry. I do have to run. Um, in terms of plugging, uh, no, not really. Just follow me on Twitter, Alex Macaroon. Um, if you've got anything bad to say, just don't. Um, and uh, yeah, because as I said, my business, I've not got any kind of website or anything up yet. Um, so I can't really advertise that at the moment. But you know, no, repeat podcasters can use it as long as they don't clash with my times, basically. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. All That's right. Exactly well, it. thanks, mate. Thanks for your time. And of course, it's buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon if you want to support the show. NickDixon.net for my sub stack, five quid a month. Very, very reasonable. And Alex has to go. He's signaling. So we better go and we'll see you again next week. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.